<clears throat> Hello. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at. <clears throat> Welcome to DBW Global. Um, wanted to start the webinar a couple minutes early and let people come on in. My name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of Project Voice. The executive producer of Digital Book World. We're really excited um, just to gather people together today and um, give six really good organizations a chance to share what they're doing and share a little bit about themselves. And uh, we're excited to do that. Um, while people are coming on in, um, just want to talk uh, decorum, I guess, is the word I would use. If you've got, there's not going to be a lot of time for questions uh, during the, the presentations. There might be a little bit. Uh, if you have a question, uh, we invite you to use the Q&A function of um, the Zoom rather than put something in the chat. Um, and uh, as the six presentations go along, uh, if there's time to answer the questions, we'll certainly get to those. Everybody who's registered for DBW Global will have access to the audio and the video uh, of the proceedings after it's over. Usually we send those out within a couple of days. So if you miss something, if you wish that you had caught something that somebody said, um, you'll have access to that. Uh, we're excited about Digital Book World 2023. If you haven't seen that, uh, you can go to digitalbookworld.com. We just got um, what we hope is all the logos up. <laughs> we include all the logos of the different sponsors and then for organizations that are uh, part of it, maybe for the first time, we try to honor them and put the logo up there as well. Um, and soon we'll have the full program, uh, which is currently on the Eventbrite page, listed on the um, website as well. Uh, Digital Book World has moved back to New York City. So when we uh, had the opportunity to acquire Digital Book World back in late 2016, 2017, uh, we moved it to Nashville, had, had some great years there. And, uh, you know, just the, the pandemic provided the opportunity to kind of reset things. And um, as far as this specific conference goes, and this, this group of people, um, which has grown quite a bit since we took over, New York City uh, made a lot of sense. So if you wanna come out and join us in person, uh, that information is out there. There's a ton of interest. We just announced um, last week, I think that all the booths are sold out. Um, all the booths will be co-located in the same ballroom as the speaking is going on. It's a format that we used successfully for a different event earlier this year. So uh, that's what you can expect there. So <clears throat> let me see, we've got our first speaker. We're gonna try to stay on time um, as more folks come on into the Zoom. Um, Dwayne, I see you, I'm gonna promote you up to panelist with Book Fusion. Dwayne, how are you? Uh, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Mute. Ah, there we go. Hi, Bradley. I'm not too bad. How are you doing? Hey, doing good. Doing good. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for being part of Digital Book World with us. Thanks for being part of DBW Global with us. Um, I am going to make you host. All right. So All you, right. Yeah, so you can share your screen now. All right, no problem. And thank you as well for the opportunity. All right. All right, can everyone see the screen? It looks great. So great to have you, Dwayne. I'm going on mute. All right. So thank you again, everyone, for attending this presentation. So really briefly, um, we're going to talk about upgrading the reading experience. So I'm Dwayne Campbell, the founder and CEO of Book Fusion. But before we go into, up, into what is the reading experience and upgrading the reading experience, let me first introduce you to Book Fusion. So most of you might not be aware of Book Fusion because we have been busy building out the platform. Right, and so what Book Fusion is, is the best way to organize, read, share, and derive value from content, whether you're using it to learn, for work, or for pleasure. And so the platform is currently available on Android, web, and iOS, and we have plans to also develop native desktop apps across Linux, Windows, and OS X next year. 
Now, in terms of solutions that we offer, we offer three solutions, two of which, um, for example, for the business segment, we allow business organizations to create their own private digital library where they are able to license content from publishers and authors while being able to securely distribute and give access to proprietary content such as training manuals, white papers, and other content securely to employees. What we have seen is that business organizations previously used um, SharePoint or other um, ad hoc solutions where there is not a in integrated reader. And so these organizations or the members rather would have to download the different file types and open them in specific different applications. And in the business end, the content is not properly protected by DRM. All right. And similarly for the education segment, we work with ministries of education, universities and schools to launch their digital initiatives to provide them with a platform that allows them to easily distribute and give access to teacher created content or district created content, while at the same time, again, giving them the flexibility to license content from publishers and authors, both local and international publishers. All right, but even though we're book fusion, our mission is much broader than that. If you look at reading today, reading is now multimedia, right? And so our mission is really to revolutionize the way that we read and interact, not just with ebooks, but with articles, but with audiobooks and also with videos by building a single platform that allows readers to obtain, organize, read, share, and derive value from content, regardless of whether you're using the content to learn, for work, or for pleasure. Okay, so, so far, we've already partnered with several publishers. This is just a handful of the publishers that we work with. You know, we work with Collins, Hodder Education, Macmillan Education, and Oxford University Press. We're also on the lookout to partner with multiple um, additional publishers. So if a publisher is watching this presentation and you like where we're bringing the reading experience, please feel free to reach out. Now let's give a quick snippet of some of our customers. So for our enterprise, our business solution, we currently work with Akamai Technologies, um, which most would be familiar with Akamai. Um, they're a publicly traded company. We work with Phoenix Contact and Build a Trend, and we have several other customers. Now, when you look at the educational segment, we work with the Ministry of Education in Jamaica to distribute their own created content, but also have licensed content and generated upwards of 800,000 um, USD in sales this year alone for publishers. And so we distribute this content to over 200,000 students. We also work with the Ministry of Education in Trinidad and Tobago to digitize their own created content. And we also work with the Michael University College to power their digital library for university students. And so this is just a quick snapshot of some of our clients. All right. Now, just before we go into upgrading the reading experience, we wanted to share with you some of the reviews that we got from our poor reader segment. And so who are these poor readers? Poor readers are the readers that typically obtain eBooks from Humble Bundle, Smashwords, um, Packet Pub, or various DRM free um, resources where they purchase these books. And so they tend to look for other reading apps outside of the Kindle ecosystem that treats these eBooks as first-class citizens. And so what we do, we allow these users to sign up and use the platform to easily upload, organize, read, and share their eBooks. Their reading progress highlights, notes are seamlessly synced across all devices. All right, and so this is now a good segue into the reading experience. All right, so upgrading the reading experience. So we're going to save most of this for the main event um, in Digital Book World in January, but we're going to touch on some aspects of how we push the reading experience. And so when you think about reading today, really digital reading is really just a replica of, of print books. And so our philosophy is that digital reading can be so much more, and it could start as simply as improving the way highlights and annotations are done. So in this um, quick video, as you'll see, 
the basic things are supported, such as being able to highlight text. But when compared to other platforms, the end users are not able to just select from five predefined colors, they can select custom colors. Now, we take this a bit further. What about when you're reading technical books or scientific work that has images, code snippets, tables? How do you make highlights and annotations? And this is a basic feature that should be present in all ebook, to, ebook readers today, but it's not. And so this is the ability to make area or image-based highlights and being able to add notes and annotations. This significantly improves the experience for knowledge readers. Now, taking this a bit further, each highlight is treated as a unit, all right? And so you can add specific tags to the highlight to identify what that highlight is about. Now, you're able to see this, um, and I'll touch on why those tags are important in the next slide. Now, you also have a nice interface to get a quick overview of your highlights and notes that you made that you can then sort not just by the date that you had it, but also by the, the, re the reading progress or how the chapter was laid out. And so this is where you see the name of the chapters. And obviously support rich export options. Um, that's available with this button here, where you can export in Markdown, HTML, CSV, a variety of other formats to allow you to integrate it into your workflow, whether you're using um, Obsidian, LogSec, or Readwise. Now, as I touched on earlier, highlights with tags, right? Uh, sorry, let me move to the next slide. Oh, no. Yep. So, Tag, why do you use tags when highlighting? Imagine a reader is reading a book about the water cycle or a particular book and they're reading research papers, they're reading multiple textbooks and they want to be able to, in this example, um, let's say you want to see all the books for growth and marketing that you have read and all the highlights and annotations. We provide a dedicated highlights and annotation interface to allow readers to seamlessly and quickly find your relevant notes and highlights. They can also do full text search across these notes and highlights. And so immediately, this provides a significant lift to readers that are reading to derive and extract um, knowledge from content. Okay. No, social. So social reading has been done before. Right, but um, we believe it has not been done properly. The most successful case in social reading is Goodreads. Right, however, um, for most folks that are in this space, you would have been aware that Goodreads closed off their APIs totally to third parties, and it's really just a closed community at this time. And so, we think social reading can be so much more. And so, when folks read, you read. The book, in our opinion, is both a private object and a social object. And so social reading should not be forced on the reader. And so what we have done, we have built in social into the platform in such a way where it's totally opt-in. So if you're reading a book, you can opt to share a particular highlight with friends or family, or you can share multiple highlights with friends or family. And so now, your friend that's reading this book can then open their book and have your highlight displayed and overlaid within context inside that book, right? I know you take that a bit further. Um, somebody might have made a provocative comment. You know, you might want to have a discussion within that book. And so you have a lively discussion there, all right? And continuing to build on social a bit more. Um, as you can see here, this, oh, give me one second. This is currently in private beta with a few of our poor readers. And so this is a profile page. In this case, it's, it's my profile. As you can see, you're able to browse um, your activities that, that you had and your comments and highlights. Many more activities will be done. You're also able to browse the general activities of re reading activities generated within your network. So you could see reviews that have been made, highlights that have been made by your friend. You could then have discussions, tag them and continue. You could then browse your friend's profile and um, look again at their activity, request a book to be borrowed and interact. And these are just some of the aspects where we're making this um, social aspect seamless and non-disruptive to privacy. And um, we have been getting rave, free, rave reviews from our current segment of readers that have access to the private beta for this. All right, let me go to the next slide. 
All right. And so that really quickly was just a quick snippet of um, some, of the, some of the ways we're pushing the reading experience. As mentioned, we wanted to save some of the content for the main event next year, um, Digital Book World in January. But just to quickly touch on, you know, some of the stuff that's upcoming. Um, when you're reading um, and books typically have an index or when you search for a keyword, what you really have is a question that, that you want to be answered. So you could have question and answering in the book. And so this is, let's say you're reading a book about the water cycle. You could simply type, um, how does the water cycle work? And you quickly see a snippet and immediate answer on how this is broken down and how it's worked without reading all the chapters, right? And you can see that this is not too far out. This is something that we had in the pipeline a long time ago, and we're happy to see that Meta, I think if you guys follow the natural language processing news, recently released a model, Galactica, I believe, that is able to do some of this. This model was trained on a variety of scientific uh, material. Now, what about, can you imagine on-demand summarization? Obviously, this will start first with factoid-based books, you know, but imagine you're reading a chapter and similar to news articles today where you could get a concise summary, you could just with the tap of a button, get a summary of what's being read. Now, also imagine location of where reading, right? And so this is a concept where we have talked with some of the authors, mainly about in the authors where you have chapters that do not get unlocked unless you go to a particular location um, where that story was set. Um, and then in the educational segment, you can think about text simplification. And so, as you know, in the educational setting, you have readers um, in a school setting, you have readers that have different reading levels. But now you could have the publisher write a single book, but then with a toggle or a tap of a button, the reader is able to adjust the reading, the reading level where the words and segments and keywords are changed to be simplified according to the reading level um, selected, all right? And so there's so much more that we have in the pipeline. And so that's it really quickly. Um, let me see. Yep, so um, that really quickly was a quick introduction, you know, to Book Fusion, um, where we see reading, um, the reading experience going and um, touched on some of the things that we have in the development pipeline. So thank you guys for listening and um, let me know if you have any questions. Dwayne, that was great. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hit reclaim host here. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, so thank you for kicking us off. And um, you know, what you're doing is really interesting. I, I will tell you, I just, it was just yesterday, I saw a demo of, um, and I, I, I'm going to get the website wrong. I think it, it explain paper AI. Mm -hmm. It was, I can't remember if it was explain paper AI or summarize yeah. paper AI, AI. It was something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, a, a real time sum, summarization mm -hmm. of all you do is you uh, upload a paper, and, and the demo involved uh, technical material. Mm -hmm. So you upload a paper. And uh, if you don't highlight any text, it just summarizes the whole thing and it just slaps it to the to the right. Mm -hmm. So you can see a summary and it's like, it works. Yep. <laughs> and then if you summer, if you highlight a certain amount of text, so you, you, you exclude some stuff, uh, it works pretty well, pretty well too doing mm -hmm. that. I, I didn't see the demo and, you know, the demo wasn't used on like fiction or anything. No. Although I would have liked to have seen that. <laughs> But but yeah, that what's your that that little thing that you mentioned there? I just saw it yesterday. It's really interesting. So yeah, so to comment on that, you know, my master's was in natural language processing and I actually worked on summarization. So I do not think you'll see it for fiction at least for a long while. You know, more factoid based stuff. But one of the reasons why we did not implement it initially in our platform was that when we started implementing a lot of this this new these new technologies, we realized that they are not beneficial to the end user if they hate to use the platform to read. You know, so folks need to, to love the, the platform that's used to read and consume content, then to allow them to derive value at the next level as well. So we shifted focus a little bit, but then some of that will be coming as well. It's, interest, it's an interesting commentary on our educational mm -hmm. system that there's such a priority on this too, by the way. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to see cliffnotes.ai Mm -hmm. or, or whatever where uh 
you know, now you don't have to read anything. Where's the AI that makes the reading harder? That's what I want to give my son, you know. <laughs> that's uh, true. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, thank you for mm -hmm. kicking us off. Uh, really interesting to see what you're doing. Looking forward to seeing you in January. All right. Thank you, Bradley. You got it. So I'm going to put you back as attendee. There we go. So as people continue to come into the Zoom, um, just to touch on what we said earlier, if you have a question, use the Q&A, don't use the chat uh, thing here. Uh, if you have a question, we'll try to get to that. There won't be a lot of time for that, but if you do have one, throw it in there. And uh, all registrants um, for DBW Global will receive access to the audio and video uh, recordings, uh, usually within 48 hours of uh, of the event ending. So next up, we've got Positron and really interesting company here, SE Adam Fritz. I'm going to promote him to panelist. Adam, how are you? Good, thanks, Bradley. How are you doing? Doing fine. Good to see you. And thanks for being part of DBW Global with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. You got it. So I'm going to make you host, which will let you share your screen. Fantastic. Yeah, and y'all are y'all are pretty unique. So looking for I'm looking forward to hearing what you're doing and getting caught up myself. So thank you for being part of the event Perfect. today. With no problem at all. Uh, can you see my screen here? Yes, it looks great. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for having me. I'm Adam Fritz. I'm the CEO of Positron. Uh, we're a company designed to make uh, any scripted audio uh, productions easier, faster, and more efficient. Um, also, we'll make your team more accurate because we're using AI to make the humans involved in your audio productions um, better at their jobs, not to replace them in the process. Uh, we began development in 2017, and we launched commercially at the beginning of 2019. Uh, we're growing quickly, um, and our goal is to build state-of-the-art software tools to change the way audiobooks and other forms of scripted audio are produced. Uh, there we go. My computer froze for a second. Um, we do use AI. Uh, however, as I said, um, we're not using AI to replace humans in the process of audio production. Um, we do not use uh, your data to create an AI likeness of your voice. We're not looking to replace human narrators. We do not sell or share your data to any third parties, and we do not replace human proofers, editors, or narrators with software. Um, <clears throat> our tool is uh, well into development on essentially allowing human narrators and other humans involved in the audio production process uh, to stay ahead of those AI narrators um, that are you know, uh, quickly taking more market share in the audiobook industry. Um, our team is global. We are a remote company. Uh, we're headquartered in just outside of Seattle, Washington. Uh, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, and our team is uh, located in Canada, the United States, and Ukraine. Uh, so it's been an interesting year for our company, but thankfully all of our Ukrainian team members are, uh, are safe, and though they are certainly lacking a lot of electricity these days. Um, we have a tool designed for every step of the audiobook production process. Um, our script preparation tools will allow you to do your pronunciation research, um, create character voices, and mark up your scripts easier and faster. Um, our pronunciation tool, for example, I'm going to show you a quick demo here. So you're going to upload your manuscript, you open the suggestions and pronunciation, and our algorithm will tell you every word that your narrator may not know how to pronounce, and then automatically research those words for you with the correct text and audio pronunciations. Bedivere, Bedivere. You can also use the character voice guide to scan your script for every character name. You can add notes about the character. And then also record yourself speaking up to 30 seconds in that character's voice. A lot of our uh, users will use these tools, A, to collaborate amongst teams. So for example, in the pronunciation research, if I scroll back on the video here, in the pronunciation research, if there is a word that, or a name, for example, that your narrator or whoever's doing your pre-production doesn't know how to pronounce, um, they can share this with the author or other stakeholder, um, or even a, a foreign language expert, for example, if there's German words in an English book, <clears throat> and um, record and collaborate, record those correct pronunciations so your narrator is not going to have any because they 
they didn't know how to do a pronunciation of a certain word. Um, from the character side of things, a lot of our uh, users will actually um, then share their uh, recorded character voices with a stakeholder, whether that's the author or rights holder, to make sure there's buy-in on how those characters are going to be performed, to make sure it fits with um, the, the goal and the vision of those, uh, of those stakeholders. The other thing you can do is if you're creating a book series, uh, you can transfer your research from book one to book two and book two to book three, so you're never having to repeat work um, and redo your work uh, throughout a series. Once you've done your uh, your all your script preparation, you can actually click one button and export a marked up script. So it'll export your PDF back to you with every word on your pronunciation guide highlighted in yellow with a phonetic comment box, as you can see uh, right here. Um, you can also uh, phonetic comment box with the correct phonetic pronunciation. Um, characters are also highlighted in a different color. So whenever a character comes up, um, your narrator while they're narrating will know exactly what what uh, how to act that character and what voice to use. Our next step of this tool is we're building an HTML teleprompter. So not only will it just have a highlight and a text box, you'll be able to hover over the name Guinevere, for example, click play and listen to the correct pronunciation. Um, we're also building a tool that will allow you to automatically highlight all lines of dialogue for a certain character in a certain color. So a lot of narrators are doing this already uh, manually in a tool like iAnnotate or Adobe Acrobat. Our goal is to speed that up by doing it automatically. Um, so you're still doing that same high quality preparation in a fraction of the time. The core part of our tool is an audio proofing tool. Um, for those of you involved in any scripted audio production, be it audiobooks or, or commercial voiceover or anything else, um, proofreading a, uh, a piece of scripted audio is extremely manual and very difficult. Um, it takes a lot of time. It can take one and a half to two hours for every one hour of audio uh, of, of recorded audio. Our tool will get you as close as possible to that one to one ratio, one hour of work to proof one hour of audio, or if you're using our tool to um, do a, essentially a quick scan through of what our algorithm is detecting, you can do it in a fraction of that time. You know, uh, you can prove an hour of audio in less than 10 minutes. Um, our tool is designed to catch missed words, added words, mispronunciations, long pauses, and noises. Uh, we are just today or tomorrow about to release our beta for all noise detection. So currently we catch all um, all audio distortions like hard clipping in your audio file, um, but we're just about to release uh, noise detection for everything. A dog barking, a lawnmower in the background, um, your kids screaming. Luckily, my kids are at school right now, so they're not uh, screaming in the background. But that'll be a huge step towards basically Positron catching everything in your audio file that should not be there. And your proofers are just focusing on those creative elements like character voice and acting. Um, our audio proofing tool is available in English, Spanish, German, Swedish, French, and Norwegian. And we are working on releasing uh, Danish, Italian, and Portuguese currently. Um, show you a quick demo here, but essentially what our tool will do is it will play your audio file, highlight every word as it is spoken, and you'll see a little red underlined on the next page on the words on the right side matched with something on the left with the details of your mistake. Um, think of it as like spell check for your recorded audio. Now such an experience had come that night to Peter. When we last saw him, he was stealing across the island with one finger to his lips and his dagger at the ready. He had seen the crocodile pass by without noticing anything peculiar about it. But by and by, he remembered that it had not been ticking. At first he thought this eerie, but soon concluded rightly, but soon concluded rightly that the clock had run so you down. Can see um, here, you've got a bunch of annotations, what we call as potential mistakes that our algorithm has flagged. What your human proofer needs to do is just go through and listen to each one of those mistakes and click OK or pick up. Um, OK, basically meaning either it is a very minor mistake that doesn't need to be fixed or it's not a mistake and our algorithm was being a little bit too careful. Um, pick up simply means this is something that needs to be re-recorded. Once you've gone through and listened to all of your audio, uh, you're going to be where many, if you're doing this manually, you're going to have someone with an Excel sheet open, the PDF open and the audio file open, and they're manually making notes, you know, um, for example, uh, 00, 00 2905, um, a word inversion. We last for when last should be last we, and the narrator said we last. Um, in our tool, you're going to press one button. And, or a couple clicks of a mouse, I should say, and it's going to export this HTML pickup packet, which shows you the details of um, the mistake, the slate number here, number one, um, the tag, so misread, you can also tag individual narrators as well as the timestamp. 
Uh, you're also going to have the um, uh, the uh, the full text of that mistake, as well as if you click that little play button down there, it'll actually play your original audio file, um, showing you exactly what that original mistake was. Your narrator can re-record and fix that and fix that in um, in narration. You can also export the same detail in Excel format, uh, where you know people who are narrators who are more used to a traditional Excel-based pickup packet can export all that same information. You can see here the slate number, the tags that you included, the type of mistake, the time code, the notes uh, of the actual mistake, the page number in the original script, as well as the context, so the actual um, the words that uh, that are mistakenly read. You can also then integrate uh, with multiple DAWs. So we support currently Pro Tools, Studio One, Audacity, Reaper, Twisted Wave, uh, Audition, and Hindenburg. Uh, we are also working on Nuendo and WaveLab currently and are working on many other integrations. Basically what this allows you to do, once you've marked everything as a pickup, on the bottom here, you can see your um, you can see your DAW session, and you're able to export a marker file that will mark in your digital audio workstation exactly where every mistake needs to get edited or fixed. A very powerful tool, um, and it'll basically cut your editing time uh, significantly because there's no more searching and finding in that DAW file um, to to find that mistake and fix it. The other thing that this uh, is, is a huge help for is if you're a larger company working with a large team um, and you have you know, a narrator, a proofer, and an editor, our tool will allow you to collaborate much, uh, much faster. So we've just launched a pickup recording tool where after you, let me just jump back here, after you export this pickup packet, you can actually have your narrator uh, click a little button and then go in and it'll automatically load every single one of your pickups to be recorded inside of Positron. So here you can see this waveform. That's the original audio file. You're going to click that little red microphone button. And in a browser-based setting, you can uh, record your pickup audio file, send it for approval for any project stakeholder, whether that's an author, uh, a project manager, or a director. They can listen to that pickup that you've recorded. They can give you feedback using a comment bu button and then approve that pickup. Uh, once those uh, pickups are approved, with a couple clicks of a mouse with that download audio button, you're going to be able to export all of your pickup audio as a single uh, audio file, MP3 or WAV format, or as individual audio files for each pickup. Um, those can be paired with those DAW markers that, that I showed you. So there's going to be no more needing to record in your DAW, upload it into the cloud, send a link to your editor. It's just they are that editor already has access to your project. Once those pickups are recorded here, she will be notified couple clicks of a mouse, download the audio in the DAW file, the DAW marker file, and it'll make your uh, collaboration amongst your team much, much easier, especially in a remote recording setting. Um, the next steps of this tool are going to be able to actually, with a couple clicks of a mouse, be able to proofread those uh, pickups to make sure that what that recorded pickup matches exactly what it should be in the script, um, and many other tools designed to increase the, uh, the speed, accuracy, and efficiency of your audio productions amongst team members. We've also launched a number of project management tools. These are more designed for uh, larger teams, but quite frankly, if you have more than, even if you're just a single person working on ACX, uh, doing a, a full production all by yourself, these tools will help you. <clears throat> so one of our tools is a project estimation and scheduling tool that will scan your script. And then based on the total number of words in your script, will provide you um, an estimate of how long it will take you to narrate, how long it will take you to proof and edit that audio. These are all based on industry and or, uh, industry standards in terms of uh, amount of work hours required to produce an hour of finished audio. Um, as we get moved forward with these tools, instead of using industry averages, it will actually use um, the actual data from your system. So if you're actually, once we've built in the full tool to record an entire book inside of Positron, it will be able to measure you were in, you, you recorded three hours of audio in four and a half hours and use that ratio to calculate future projects as well. Um, we're also building an integration into the most common scheduling tools. So if you're gonna say, I have to work for 20 hours of narration to record this book, um, and I'm planning on working four days a week times three hours, you can actually build that in and export that into your schedule to schedule your work um, and determine exactly uh, when you're gonna be doing that narration and then also making sure that you're hitting your, uh, your target deadlines on, um, uh, on when the project is due. Um, you can have multiple team members involved in the project. There is absolutely no cost for user seats. So you can have 50 different people involved in a project um, in different with different roles and permissions. Um, all you're going to do is use that share button on the top right 
uh, the little blue share button you can see there, type in their email address, set their permissions, and they're going to receive an email invitation like you can see at the bottom. Um, they all have to create a free account inside of Positron, absolutely no cost, and they can be involved in a project in any way that you that you desire. Um, we're also able to set up for larger companies more of an enterprise style uh, account where you have one account where all of your audio files and all of your projects are hosted. And then you can have individual project managers, editors, and everything else who have access to every project in your system based on your uh, required permissions and, and rights and responsibilities. We're currently building things like threaded comments, um, collaborator tagging, and automated notification between project stakeholders. So in a project, when a narrator uploads the audio file, the proofer gets notified that chapter one is ready to proof. When chapter one is proofed, your, um, your editor will get notified and the, and the narrator will get notified that the pickups and the DAW markers are ready to download. Every time we can save you 30 seconds uh, during an audio production, over the course of a seven to 10 hour audiobook, it'll add up to hours of man time saved. We've also launched an audio analysis tool that will allow you to upload your mastered audio files and test against your distributor specifications, give you an output of everything, audio channel, true peak, sample peak, noise floor, bit rate, sample rate, RMS, loudness, room tone, and your file size and file length to make sure that when you submit those audio files to your distributor, they won't get bounced back for non-compliance. Um, the next steps of this tool are gonna be really powerful using ASR to make sure, for example, that the first Part of every audio chapter starts with chapter number, chapter name, uh, which if you do not start every chapter with chapter one, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, for example, it'll get bounced back because that audio file on Audible needs to start with those details. Also be able to scan your audio sample to make sure there's no explicit terminology, sexual or violent content, which would again get that bounced back uh, from your distributor. We work with hundreds of customers, big and small, across the audio production industry, uh, Blackstone Publishing, John Marshall Media, uh, Dion Audio. Um, we also work with many people outside of audiobooks and, and specific like Autumn, which is owned by the New York Times, uh, Disney Publishing, um, and then a number of not-for-profits like uh, Learning Ally, the Royal Institute for the Blind, and the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Um, if you're a large publisher all the way down to an individual narrator, our tool will work for you and we have different uh, workflows for each type of um, each type of customer. Our pricing is all based on uh, per hour of audio. So our uh, proofing is based on how much audio you upload. It's our prices are communicated by the hour, but everything's charged down to the minute. Um, if you're a small customer doing two hours of audio a month, you're going to be paying $12 PFH. If you're a large publisher doing 600 hours or more, you're going to be paying closer to seven, uh, between six and seven dollars uh, per hour. So very flexible pricing plans. Everything is only month to month. So we understand that most uh, audio productions are not straight line. You're doing the same number of hours every month. We have flexible plans uh, that are month to month, so you can change as needed. Um, if you're interested in a free demo, if you're interested in a free trial of our tool, or just to ask us how our tool works, uh, please email us at hello at positron.com. Um, I can be reached at adam at positron.com as well. Uh, would love to chat with you. Would love to see how our tool can help your audio productions. Uh, we're found at www.positron.com. Please check us out. Please book a demo. Send us an email. Would love to hear from each and every one of you. And thank you for your time today. Adam, yeah, great job. Uh, I'm going to hit reclaim host here. Um, really good presentation. And it you, you're ambitious. You know, it, it almost makes me tired <laughs> to look at all the stuff that you're doing um, and the, the surface area of it all. Um, I got two questions for you. First of all, what's sure. been the what's what's been the hardest? You you touched on all kinds of stuff, a lot of it publishing mm -hmm. related, some more audio uh, generically. Yeah. What, what's been the hardest part of putting this suite of tools together? Um, I mean, technically, we built a lot of really cool technical tools. Um, the hardest part is that no, no two companies build audio the same way. Uh, so making sure I'm a big believer in Swiss Army knife development and making sure our tool will work for any different type of workflow. So quite frankly, uh, the hardest part has been making sure our tool works for company A, just as it does for company B, even though they have completely different size teams. One of them's remote, one of them works in person. Um, so that's been the hardest part is uh, building a tool that's customizable, but then also simple to understand and simple to use. The other question for you is you covered so much ground in that presentation. The only thing that I didn't see is a slide that has in big text, 
some sort of testimonial saying, my God, these people are amazing. Uh, they just saved me like, uh, they just changed my life. Uh, tell me about uh, some customer feedback you've gotten um, already just with some of the tools in beta, some of the stuff in development where you are, um, how you've been able to impact, you know, specifically for this conference day, the publishing space. Uh, yeah, I can read you a testimonial actually right now. If you go to our uh, positron.com, I believe it's slash clients. Uh, we've got a ton of different testimonials on there. Um, Give me the best I can read one. You, I can read you one uh, right here. Let me just find it. Uh, testimonials. Um, can read you one from Blackstone Publishing, uh, which is a large publishing house. We're extremely happy with Positron Solution and their responsiveness to change by refactoring our audio proofing progress at, process and integrating Positron at key stages. We're able to reduce our audio proofing time by an average of 33% while improving our catch rate for issues. The GRPC API allows us to create and manage our projects from within our own ERP, making it possible for engineers, editors, and proofers to use the tools they're already familiar with. So uh, we work with customers big and small. Uh, I can almost guarantee we're going to cut your production time in audio significantly. Um, some, in some cases, based on how users use our tool and how their production was, uh, we could cut your time in half in many cases. Um, so please reach out to us. We are open to custom development as well. We're a small, agile company. Uh, we want to make sure our tool works for your workflow. Y'all are, you're, you're interesting. It's exactly what I love about digital book world. And you touch more of our space than that. But, you know, we love interesting companies doing interesting stuff. That's you, Adam. Thank you for the time. No problem. Thank you very much, Bradley. You got it. So I'm going to put you back as attendee. So uh, we're staying on time here. We're doing a good job with that. Um, I'm going to call up the Creatokia folks in just a moment. Um, you know, we've, we've, we definitely want to touch uh, with digital book world, both with this today uh, and, and, and more so in January on NFTs. Um, it's a controversial topic. Um, it's an interesting topic. It's a topic that's going absolutely nowhere. So we're excited to have these folks uh, talk to us about it. Uh, I'm going to call them both up here. Let me see. Raquel, I'll call you first. And then Karsten, let me see. Raquel, how Hello. are you? Oh, Hi, Bradley. Nice. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for being here. And uh, I couldn't find Karsten on the list here. It's because he raised his, raised his hand and brought him to the top. All right, there we go. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Thanks for being part of DBW Global with us. Hi. Karsten, how are you? I'm fine. Yeah, I was just looking for the camera and the screen share options, but I think we are prepared. Yeah, there you go. So, Karsten, I'm going to make you host, which will allow you to share your screen. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say myself. I'm going to go on mute and let you do your thing. Yes. Make sure you can share your screen first, and I'll go on mute. There you go. Yep, that looks great. Karsten, Raquel, thank you for being here. Yes. Okay. So let me introduce ourselves. So we are Creatokia. We are an NFT platform designed for publishers. And we help getting you started with Web3 and NFTs. So the best place to start that uh, is to understand the opportunities and the context. So here they are in this presentation. We brought to you the hype about NFTs and I want to mention this. This is only an overview. So we acknowledge that this is not an in-depth view on NFTs and blockchain, all the technology. It's just a sneak peek of what we are talking about in detail in January. But I have a lot prepared here. Raquel and me brought a lot of topics for you here. So really to understand the hype, we have to start where it all started with Web 1. So Web 3 is not going away, as we've just heard. Um, we are in a moment here right now, like, Web 2 has been before, and it's not going away. It's feeling like in the 90s when the internet started. And again, later, when I explained to the companies I had in my agency how to participate in Web 2 and social media. So the most important topics for you to understand here is right now, we are coming from a central world on the left side, going to a decentral world on the right side. So we are coming from Web 1, where we had only consumption, only reading, going over to web two where you can read and write. And for example, if I buy a book on Amazon and I want to write an, a comment on that, you, you all know about these comments on Amazon and wherever else and Twitter and so on. So this has been web two, but 
whatever we are writing there is not our ownership. So if I'm writing a comment on a book on Amazon, it's belonging of Amazon, not of my own. So now we are moving to Web3 and now everything we put on the blockchain and that's the technology behind that can be owned by the people they create the stuff. And it's extremely interesting for dealing with books, with NFTs. So let me first explain what really NFTs are about. So NFTs stands for non-fungible tokens. So maybe you have heard about tokens and in the press, you can often read about cryptocurrencies and all the bad things, but there are a lot of good things. Cryptocurrencies are only tokens which are fungible. So one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin, but NFTs are non-fungible Bitcoins and non-fungible tokens, sorry for that, non-fungible tokens, and they are non-replaceable. So they are digitally pro protected objects on a blockchain, a digital ledger. You can use NFTs to create and sell a lot of things in limited numbers. So they are unique digital items. NFTs can be linked to digital content called unlockables. So you can add images, text, audios, whatever you want to add to a book, uh, which fit to the story or the nonfiction book. NFTs can furthermore act as a user authentication for access to digital communities. So you have uh, like a member pass, you can enter, for example, some restaurants in New York only if you are part of a dedicated community. Then you can have transactions and ownership, and they are really transparent on the blockchain. And this is very efficient and very trustful, um, even if you read other stories on, on the internet, for example. So NFT resales and trades are regulated. As mentioned, uh, a lot of stuff began with all these hyped and fancy images. So a lot of people were talking about fancy JPEGs. So um, yeah, that started with fancy JPEGs. Uh, the, the images on top of the slide, you see 5,000 images. So these are 5,000 days of an artist called Beeple and he sold that for $70 million. And this was not in the dark net or somewhere in the internet. This took place at Christie's. So this was a huge story and uh, one of the first biggest story um, everybody were aware about. Then the board apes came and these are these board images. Somebody talks about them in that way, but Tom Brady, Madonna, Ben Simmons, and a lot of other celebrities owns one of them. So a lot of people want to own one of these JPEGs. And for sure, an image can be right click safe to your um, hard drive, but the ownership that you really own one of these images is only stored on the blockchain and this is exactly an NFT. And that's exactly the story I said uh, with um, the ownership and uh, the authentication. So there are restaurants or clubs where you can only enter if you are part of a group. For example, the board ape groups. And then there has been one first story of publishing. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk on the right uh, bottom corner is an author. He writes about marketing and a lot of people want to get in contact with him. And he organizes uh, conferences and you can enter there for free if you own one of his NFTs. And to get one of these NFTs, you can buy one or you buy 12 books and then you get one of his NFTs. People bought 12 or 25, uh, 24 books, sorry. Um, that's not the best story for, for our planet, but it's just the use case what you can do with that. So now we can switch to the opportunities for publishers and Raquel will tell you some about that. Hello, can you hear me and see me? Yes, perfect. perfect. Um, so as an industry, we are only starting to think of ways that the blockchain technology and the NFT format can be a tool for publishers. And we will go deeper into all of these opportunities during our session in January. But um, here at Creator Talk, yeah, we think there are two categories that have the most um, apparent the, the clear advantages for publishers. Uh, one, uh, the first one has to do with our readers. So NFTs and blockchain takes um, interactions with, with readers to a whole new level. So as an industry, we're on early medium stages of using uh, direct-to-consumer tools and marketing. We're using social media and e-commerce solutions, but NFTs will open a whole new branch of ways to interact directly with our readers, to, to build brand, um, brand loyalty, and to build communities that will ultimately make your business stronger. The second ca category of opportunities for publishers are about opening a new stream of revenue. So blockchain technology allows publishers and authors to earn royalties from secondhand sales. I'm sure you have all heard about that. 
Uh, but publishers can also monetize a lot of content that goes together with your books, additional chapters that are not necessarily sold through uh, traditional retailers. Um, so the yeah, additional chapters, deleted scenes from an audiobook, author interviews, um, and you can even earn revenue from content that is created by your fans. Uh, that would be very interesting to, to explore. Um, and a great thing about NFTs is, is that blockchain technology makes transactions very transparent. And so it's very easy to, to collaborate, to share royalties, and to open up this new um, stream of revenue. Yeah, there, there is one thing to, to add, um, very important and, and a nice story. If you look to the second topic here, the royalties is really something very interesting. There have been some NFT projects starting with just simple stories. The community grew and nowadays the NFTs from these stories are sold for a lot of money and people from the community are creating new stories. Um, it has been a written book. Now it's a comic book. They are even on the way to Hollywood. So on every step of that, you can maybe participate if you set up your smart contracts, your NFTs in the right way. And we are here to help you in there. That's right. Yeah, especially interesting in publishing when we think about the fan fiction. <laughs> Maybe I could sell mine. <laughs> so um, what does an NFT actually look like? Uh, well, there are two types of benefits that here at Korea Tokyo we think publishers and authors should combine in an NFT and that our platform Korea Tokyo makes possible. So the first one are the collectibles or unlockables, um, Karsten mentioned before. These are the actual content that NFT owners will be able to access when you buy an NFT. It can be an image, it can be an audio file, a PDF, and you can attach as many as you want. Um, importantly, you can add, you can continue adding unlockables even after the original sale. So if a reader buys an NFT, with an original set of benefits, a year later, you can continue adding things. So this really gives long-term value to, to NFT owners. Um, and e publishers and authors can also decide uh, how many and um, how to sell your NFT. You could publish a very exclusive NFT batch of five, or you can do a thousand. You can sell a limited quantity, or you can set up a pop-up pop-up store kind of thing, where an NFT um, collection is only available uh, one hour after midnight on Halloween. On Halloween, so there is a, a lot of flexibility to adapt to the needs of each title. And then the other value has to do with uh, with the community. That what Karsten was saying before about uh new york restaurants only available for certain nft owners um so nft can act as a key to access exclusive activities um, and here you can provide value to your readers in the form of um, interviews with an author exclusive online chats uh receiving physical exclusive merchandise of your brands um and even uh giving your readers a way to weigh in on the future of a book so imagine a sci-fi series uh, with a big fan community um, and only the nft owners that bought a book and the nft of a previous book have the opportunity to weigh in on uh, what's going to happen with a character in the follow-up book of the series um, so this community value is where publishers and authors can really connect with their fans and when we i think as, a, as an industry in publishing we really can have fun with um, and now Karsten will tell us a bit more about uh, some examples and activities that you could include in your NFT um, and what an yeah. NFT can actually look like. Yeah, and the most important topic here is what Raquel just uh, told you. You are changing your consumers to people who are really doing a commitment to your products. So if you buy an NFT and you are in your target group, um, you are really more than just a consumer buying a book because people investing in an NFT are really collectors and they maybe want to see that something is coming in the future and people owning an nft are often talking about that so when i started marketing in the 90s we had this aida principle attention interest desire action action means they buy the product today we have after the action the influencer so people should talk about um, what they bought and should be very excited about that and if you are an owner of an nft you often talk about that so i put uh, the information raquel told you on the previous slide now on a slide where you see two different target groups on the left side you see such an nft fan with the most important and newest VR glasses with his headphones and so on. So he is deep into technique and he wants to collect NFTs. On the right side, you see a book fan. 
he is somebody who wants to read. He wants to have access to the author or to exclusive content. And as we have seen here, you have two types, collectibles and utilities for these target groups. For sure, there are different target groups for romance, nonfiction, fantasy, and so on. But in the NFT world, you have always the NFT fan on the left side and the book fan on the right side. And now you find the collectibles, the unlockable items on top and the utilities at the bottom. So now you can think about whatever came into your mind regarding one of your stories. And if you have some kind of digital content, everything can be an NFT. If you think about celebra celebrations, everything, every access can be an NFT. So for example, on the top left corner, you see video content. So if you write a nonfiction book, you can take, for example, a masterclass and provide access to the masterclass only for people with a token. This is called token gated content. So you go to a website where you normally in the web two world needs to um, log into the website. And nowadays with NFTs, you only have to have a wallet where the token is in. If you have it, you have access. It's very easy. Um, then you can say um, you have exclusive content on the right side. So if you have a book and have some foundations behind the book, behind the scenes, you can provide these informations and this content to a book fan. So if I'm thinking about a gra graphic novel and, and I can have access to black and white scribbles of the illustrations, I would be as a fan highly appreciating these NFTs. Um, or you can write a book and just publish one chapter after the other. Uh, after the other, so you have early access to new content, like a story pass, like if you are going to Sky Television and have a seasons pass. All these things can be done with NFTs. So this is just a glimpse. Um, we we are talking about that and how to use it in depth in the next year. So that all leads us to Creatokia. So um, you see the name Creatokia is built out of creatives. So we are talking to creative stuff, to storytellers. And we use tokens to go into this utopia. And that's why you see this island here, to have the creatives and the tokens going in, into this new world with blockchain powered next level digital publishing. So what can we do to help you on this way? Um, Creatokia um, has a Web3 fe uh, feature suit. So you have everything you need for Web3. We have learned Web1 was just reading, two were read and write. And now you have read, write, and own. For ownership, you need to pay something. So this is the point where people are losing trust in the moment to the Web3 world because the UX is missing, user experience. So if you buy something at Amazon, everybody's used to how to buy a book on Amazon. But if you go to OpenSea as one of the biggest marketplace for NFTs, nobody will understand what is happening there if you are not a crypto -nod. So the most important topic from Creatokia, what we bring here is a very, very good user experience. And for that, we have fiat transactions. So normally you have with NFTs only Ethereum checkout or cryptocurrency checkout. We have a fiat checkout, meaning standard currencies. You can pay with just uh, your credit card. Then we have um, um, the, the landing page templates you see on the right side here are a lot of topics we are offering. So I'm just going to the most important one. The landing page template you see on the right side is just good for your marketing or in the middle of the page you see Ajua Ando. She was narrating one of our NFTs. So a lot of people know her because of Bridgerton or The Witcher on, on Netflix. So this NFT is a good uh, starting point, for example, to discover what you can do with NFTs. And we have a lot more things what you can use. And uh, to just have one of the showcases to show you what you can do, here we have a drop from last Monday. Grupo Planeta um, has dropped an, uh, a book on our platform on Juan Ramon Rayo. Um, it's a book about anti-Marx. It's, it's going deeper into Marx thinking and uh, turning it upside down, so to say. And we had 99 uh, limited editions of that. We had off opened uh, the checkout on Monday evening and before midnight, everybody uh, wanted to have one and we have been sold out. So this is really a success story. So, um, yeah. This was uh, a very fast uh, run through everything we have to offer. Um, I was just looking to, to my timing here. So that's why I'm ending and uh, not going to more details on that. But maybe you have some questions. We uh, are happy to answer that. And we will showcase more details in January. So thanks a lot for listening and for your interest. <clears throat> thanks to both of y'all. Yeah, that was really interesting. I'm going to hit reclaim uh, host here. 
So uh, we do have a question. And, um, you know, th this is, uh, I'm fascinated by what you're doing. I, I Like I said, NFTs aren't going anywhere. It's interesting to hear how you presented a lot of this information. Uh, we've got uh, a question here where someone's basically written the same question twice. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of paraphrase what they've written. They want, they want to know how, you know, Creatokia and, and more generally blockchain oriented publishing can benefit people who uh, either are from a lower socioeconomic class or uh, people who just don't have that, that much money, uh, people who are poor. Um, Talk about that a minute. They, you know, the, there's 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 this perception with blockchain and NFTs and crypto that it's for everybody else and not for me. For me, I just I'm going to get scammed. Uh, every, so somebody else is going to take my money, or someone else will be successful. Uh, talk talk about how this um, can uh, create access for all sorts of uh, you know small authors, larger publishers, whoever. Yeah, um, if you are asking for people with, with less money or authors to, who have not the, the options to really make big moves, it's exactly for, for both of them. So we have seen here what Grupo Planeta was doing with a big publisher and so on with a big author. It's very easy to have uh, a lot of followers uh, on, on this um, drop date. That's the date when we offer, uh, we, we open the offer. Um, but if you are a smaller publisher or just a self-publisher, it's no problem to start working with that. And you have great opportunities because, for example, you can open your first publications for free even, and then you can participate on the royalties on the secondary market. So if you are writing a good story and your community will grow and they want to, to have your stories and your NFTs, they will pay for it. So this is exactly what a market here wanted to have years ago. We can really um, see how small pieces are growing. <clears throat> and to that, I would add what you're saying, Carson, like um, the, the high price of board apes are not the same that we're going to do in publishing. We're no. going to create our whole new thing. But the revenue, the new revenue stream is one part that we were talking about. But a very, very important part is the community, what Carson was saying. Publishers can do an NFT giveaway. They don't even need to sell it. It's you know, it's just a way of connecting with, with with the consumers. So I think that while you know we have all seen the high prices of of the traditional NFTs, we've seen up to that point. We don't think that's necessarily the way, um, the main thing, the main benefit that NFTs are going to have for the publishing industry. Yeah, imagine a world where Harry Potter is not such famous as it is today, and I open. I don't know, 1,000, 10K, whatever of these NFT books, and you have a growing community, and then you offer a free mint of just illustrations of this world of Harry Potter, and people will start trading them. And you, as the early bird publisher or as the early bird fan, will participate in that. So we've got a couple of other questions, and, and the person who asked the question that I just said uh, is very concerned that I say that person's name, Shmuel Yerushalmi, I believe, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm sure I'm not, is who asked you that question. There's a couple other questions in the um, in the Q&A related to adoption, um, but uh, we got to move on. I'm going to leave them here uh, so y'all can circle up with, with Dwayne and with John or we can connect the dots uh, after this is over. Look, Creatokia folks, thank you for being part of DBW Global. Um, I'm excited to see what you're doing. It's, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's um, uh, a testament to the technology that it has withstood uh, all of the furious feedback, you know, negative feedback uh, that's come from different, uh, you know, areas um to really focus on utility and, and bringing something new to the table so kudos to you look forward to seeing you in january thanks for being part of this today thank you bradley thanks you got it so i'm going to put both of y'all back as attendees for other questions you can just oh i was already sorry i was already <laughs> carson i was already in the process of making you an attendee yeah if so if, uh, the questions that were asked i'm leaving them in the q a um, and then there will be a follow-up email that comes out uh, from DBW um, where we'll list all the LinkedIn profiles and stuff. Um, so we'll try to make it easy uh, to, to correspond with people uh, after this is over and for everybody who's watching on demand too, which there's there's uh, quite a many, uh, quite a few of those. So next up, we have BISG. 
And let me promote uh, to the panelist, Brian O'Leary. Brian, how are you? If you can hear me. I can hear you just fine and I'm doing great, Bradley. Thank you for having me today. It's good to see you, Brian. Um, I'm going to make you host. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we love involving you with all of our digital book world stuff, Brian. We love what you do and, and what BISG does and represents. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. It's actually our pleasure, and we're looking forward to seeing you in person for the first time in quite some time, uh, although you and I did cross paths at uh, ECPA earlier this fall, but it, it's uh, it would be nice to have Digital Book World both in person again and back in New York. For sure, for sure. Thank you very much. Screen looks great. I'm going on mute. Thank you. So Bradley had asked me to talk about a more informed, more effective publishing industry supply chain. And um, I've added the word toward because it's a little bit of a symbol of what BISG is about. We're always working at trying to make the industry um, work a little bit better. Um, and what I've done today is prepare a few slides that give you background on the book industry study group, but also three different initiatives that we have that you, you will hear about one specifically at Digital Book World in January, but there are a couple of others that are directly relevant, particularly given the conversations we've been having about audiobooks and NFTs. So our, as an organization, the uh, Book Industry Study Group has four objectives. Uh, one is to serve as an information hub for the book business. Um, we do that in a variety of ways, particularly through our website, and, and then uh, serving as a, a crossroads of sorts for questions that come to us from across the industry. We spend a lot of time thinking about standards, things that improve revenue, promote product visibility, reduce expenses, and ensure transparency across the supply chain. Um, that is largely the work of our five committees that I'll talk about in a moment. We conduct research that uh, shapes the conversation about where the book industry is going. Bradley and I have kind of intersected on this on occasion, but we specifically focus on emerging topics, issues, and trends that the book industry needs to know about. Although we've not yet written the NFT white paper, I think we probably need a little bit more time on that. And the last piece is we're focused on fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion within BISG. Uh, we're a small organization, but we're also uh, staffed by uh, more than 400 volunteers who are generally employees of member companies. So we've got a lot of reach with, uh, within both uh, our own organization and across the supply chain as a whole. Our vision fundamentally is to serve as the primary resource for solving problems that affect two or more parts of book publishing. Um, and that's an important distinction. Most associations in the business are vertical. So there are organizations that represent publishers or booksellers um, or libraries. Uh, we're really focused and our membership includes uh, not only those parts of the business, but as well manufacturers and distributors um, and industry partners. We're focused on trying to solve problems that affect two or more parts of that. We have three core strategies. Uh, these are to convene, to bring people together, uh, people who have a perspective or, or a particular issue uh, that, it, that it touches upon the supply chain. Uh, we amplify, which is engaging with and pointing to the good work of others who are not the only organization doing important work in book publishing. Uh, and uh, we try to be able to be a resource for uh, folks who may not know about what ALA or, or member of company is doing. And the last piece is solving the problems, addressing those issues that affect two or more parts of the industry. And we do that largely through our committees. So the committees themselves are fundamentally book industries plumbing. And I think that I, I told the story, Bradley, you may have heard it, that uh, fundamentally, uh, no one really thinks about plumbing until something goes wrong. Uh, and then it's all you think about, uh, you know, because if you don't have access to water or electricity, then you're, you're kind of, uh, you're, that infrastructure piece is critically important. And our job is actually in its best in, incarnation to fix the problems before they become an issue for the industry. We do that in, um, through our five standing committees. These are the ones, metadata rights, Subject codes often referred to as BISAC, um, supply chain itself, and workflow. Uh, that's our committee structure. Uh, all of these committees meet monthly on a set schedule, so in the second and third weeks of the month. We have 60, uh, 60 committee meetings every year, 
uh, in addition to somewhere between 3,000 and 40 uh, webinars and some in-person events. Um, so we've got about, on average, 100 different things that we do in the course of a year. Twice a week, somebody, in, you know, on average, somebody's meeting in a BISG environment, talking about issues and trying to solve problems. Each of the committees has both long-term overall goals as well as annual goals that, that are published on our website. And they're open to participation from any member of BISG. So staff at any company that's joined BISG can put a, one or more people on a committee. I wanted to talk about three things. One is supply chain, the second is workflow, and the last is rights. And it's rights that we'll be kind of focusing on in January at Digital Book World. Uh, but specifically uh, on supply chain, I think it's axiomatic that before 2020, no one got excited about supply chain planning. Uh, it was fundamentally the case that uh, if I were at a cocktail party and I explained that I ran the supply chain organization for the book business, about midway through that sentence, somebody would be looking over my shoulders thinking there's got to be somebody else here to talk to. Uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, I'm now the most popular guy at the ball. But uh, the reality is that um, our supply chain committee has been active and busy on these kind of plumbing issues for a long period of time. And its current focus is actually way, look, it's looking at ways to improve forecasting, in particular inventory management, sales reporting, and returns. These are really practical uh, uh, on the ground issues. And we've had active discussions in committee and as well in a brown bag lunch series. If you've not had a chance to participate uh, over the last year, starting last December, we've had monthly uh, meetings uh, that are open to anyone who wants to register where we have a conversation about a supply chain topic like forecasting or printer partnerships or what's the current state of the paper market is, et cetera. And it's open to, uh, we've had as many as 250 people register. We had really vibrant conversations on each of these things. It's not recorded because uh, we want to have comfort in people talking about issues in a, in a kind of a, in that brown bag lunch series kind of sense of, you know, it's uh, there's a, a cone of, of not necessarily of silence, but it just it, we're free to talk here and, and have a conversation about uh, a supply chain issue that's really important. And uh, I think you're going to see us introduce a forecasting model and test it with volunteer data uh, in the first quarter of 2023. So um, in the next four months, I think you'll see significant progress on these four topics. And uh, we're going to have a, a uh, probably a big celebration and conversation about it at our annual meeting in April of 2023. With respect to workflow, uh, we've been tracking the strong growth in the consumption of audio formats uh, increasingly through streaming services. This is really a sweet spot for um, uh, for Bradley and Project Voice. Um, it's, it's axiomatic. I think you heard a, a couple of speakers ago that audiobook production distribution practices are evolving. Um, there are multiple ways to get to the market. Um, there are standards with respect to uh, formatting for audiobooks that are available through the W3C. They're not uniformly followed. Um, and there are new tools, including synthetic voice, that are also introducing new practices. And you heard some of that as well. Um, we're currently part of a UK-based uh, BIC. BIC is called Book Industry Communication. It's our equivalent uh, in many ways in the UK. Uh, and BIC has an audiobook workflow project going on right now. Uh, Jonathan Fiedler, who's our uh, operations manager, is an active part of that. And we're going to build on that work in 2023 to propose best practices approach for the U.S. market. It'll probably follow some of what is uh, going to be adopted in the U.K. because we don't want to create uh, a domestic or a U.S. standard and then a U.K. standard that only makes things harder for publishers, particularly when they're trying to sell internationally. But we, we do want to at least recognize that there's sometimes differences in, in the distribu distribution channels and the structure of the US market. So you can look for that probably in the second half of 2023. It'll take us some time. And the last piece is rights, which is really important to us. We're really the only organization regularly meeting about operational issues related to rights. And book publishing fundamentally is a rights business. Uh, it's, it's one of the important reasons why, Bradley, I think you put together a, a program in January that included a session on this topic. Um, we found in, in our rights committee and within BISG as a whole that managing rights well 
uh, is not often is often not a priority for publishers. It's a relatively small mark, amount of revenue. Uh, we think it could be bigger, but it's also not necessarily uh, an area that publishers are investing in. And we've written two things. The earlier paper is actually the second, an untapped uh, rights and untapped opportunity. Um, kind of outlined the upside of rights management. More recently, about a year ago, we, we published Position for Growth. It's, it's essentially a rights RRI research, that making the argument for investing in systems and solutions that support more effective rights management. Um, this committee is currently working on very practical solutions to several areas that are problematic for rights. Uh, we introduced a four-part rights FAQ in September that's available on our website. Um, and uh, we we are currently trying to, uh, we've proposed the standard for reporting royalty information and we're testing it against a number of use cases for international royalty statements received from publishers in different markets, Italy, Germany, uh, et cetera, um, it's as a, a way of <clears throat> trying to get information to publishers who've made deals, sorry about that, um, publishers who made deals with rights publishers in the United States to be able to bring back information that allow them to effectively reconcile that information and also distribute payments to um, authors in many cases that are uh, do them as a result of the deals. The third thing is we're developing a database of imprint owners. This is something that has been done in the past. It hasn't been made available in the last decade or so, but we feel like there's an opportunity to kind of lay out who owns what uh, there have been a lot of transactions over the last decade in, in particular. Uh, some imprints have gone out of business, so people who are looking for rights or permissions may not know who owns the imprint. So we're trying to create an effective database for that. Uh, it's an ongoing project, but we expect to publish it um, probably for public consumption in the first quarter of 2023, uh, and then we'll continue to add to it over time. Um, and that work involves publishers, uh, agents, vendors, and international partners. It necessarily has to, and it will continue. The last piece I wanted to just talk about is the panel that we're going to be doing at Digital Book World in January. It features Pamela Mal Malpas, who's an, a literary agent at Jennifer Lyons uh, in San Francisco, Claire Hodder from Right Zones, based in the UK. She's a founder of Rights Together, which is a great um, kind of self-organizing group of rights professionals that is increasingly uh, uh, not just during and post-pandemic international in reach. Uh, Miriam Miller from Holiday House will be talking about some of their work, particularly with respect to children's rights. And it's mod moderated by Chris Kleeman, who is chair of our rights committee. Uh, she'll be doing a great job with that. They're going to be talking specifically about current trends in rights sales and management, but they're also going to be providing an update on BISG and other resources that DBW participants are going to be able to access and share as a result of that panel. So that, that'll be a good news you can use kind of moment. To, it's on Wednesday morning, I think the second panel on Wednesday, and it will uh, uh, be a good way to kick off the last day of DBW. So wrapping up, I'd say that that we BISG, we see this as everyone's supply chain moment. This is the, the core issue these days. Uh, we feel that plumbing matters. It, we think it always matters, but the, the extent to which it matters is really visible now. Um, we've been wor working on this these kinds of topics for several years, and it's delivering value now. But I think also we see opportunities in these projects and a few others that are less relevant to the uh, DBW audience but still relevant to us, that momentum is going to build in 2023 and I think hopefully beyond. And as a call to action for folks, you can get on our mailing list, look for announcements and join if you want to see the table. The easiest way to do that is to send us a note either to me directly um, and if you find me slow in answering to info at BISG.org, I-N-F-O, and we'll get, you, we'll get you taken care of. Brian, great job. Thank uh, you. Yeah, excellent presentation. I'm going to hit uh, reclaim host. Yeah, you know, um, you're doing great work. You covered a lot of that uh, in in your slides. Um, I'm. It, it's it's interesting to me that you know I'm we're we're part of this publishing world, via digital book world, where rights and rights management is sophisticated. It's much. It's relatively mature. Um, it's a it's um, it's a well-defined animal versus 
in the AI, specifically the voice AI, conversational AI realm, where it's like, rights, what's that? <laughs> yeah. it, you know, and um, where you've got uh, stuff I've talked about before, maybe you and I have talked about before, you know, there was a, a news piece from a couple of months ago um, where a fake Joe Rogan did a podcast with fake and dead Steve Jobs. And this was a marketing device for a European startup um, uh, where they just created the voice of both these people and had them doing a fictitious podcast, which was a total nonsense, uh, talking to each other. And, um, you know, I talked about that's just an absolute disgrace that that can happen and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Uh, and soon it, it probably won't be. But, um, you know, so it's these two totally disparate realms. And I just have a lot of respect for what you're doing with the rights. And it's interesting to look at the book industry's management of rights to to hopefully get a glimpse of, the, of what the future needs to be in AI oriented areas for rights management, too. Yeah, I, I I agree with you that that I think that they're they're evolving areas. Um, I wouldn't be too hard on the AI folks, although that example is egregious. But I, I think that the the rights community in in the book business would say there's still a good upside for us to to do two things. One is to better manage rights so that the transactions are processed on a reliable basis and 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 and, their, and payments are made on a timely basis. But I think the other thing is that the universe could expand. If you think about the blockchain example for NFTs, if we could have a better use of smart contracts in that environment um, within rights, as opposed to making kind of deals on a one-to-one -one basis between individuals, I think that might uh, both uh, increase the transactions that occur and potentially cut down on, on either unauthorized or pirated content because it would make it easier for folks to be able to figure out who has, who owns the rights and what is it that I have to do to obtain them. Uh, and I think ultimately that's just more revenue in the, in the hands of the publishers and the authors who worked hard to kind of create a work. So you can just imagine if I, if I just declared one day, you know what, Stephen King's newest book, I, I own that now. And I will sell that. Uh, I grant myself access to sell that in South America. You know, I, I'd be I'd be in court uh, quickly. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in the voice AI realm, you know, I, Steve Jobs' voice, uh, we, permission. What's that? You know, and and uh, my punishment is I get I get acquired. <laughs> yeah. you know, which happens? Uh, the, a company that um, uh, famously. Uh, uh, cloned uh, Barack Obama's voice, Trump's voice, and Hillary Clinton's voice, all three of them, put them on their website, made a lot of people upset. That company was acquired <laughs> for a bunch of money. So um, strange times. But look, uh, like I said, it, we, we, we love having you be part of what you're doing. Nothing is boring to us. Thank you for making the time. No, my pleasure. Be well, and we'll see you in January. Appreciate you, Brian. So I'm going to put you back as attendee. And next up, we have audience. And let me find Hub here. There we go. I'm going to promote him to panelist. There we go. Hub, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you? Okay. I'm I'm fine. I'm well. As a matter of fact, I'm on holiday, and I'm I'm traveling, and okay. um, I'm in London right now. But I'm a Dutch native. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, but I'm in London. Uh, well, in a hotel room. You don't see that in in my Zoom picture, because that's an image from the London Book Fair from earlier this this year. It uh, it looks better than my hotel room, so I choose that. <laughs> Well, we're glad to have you here, and uh, we appreciate you making the time. I'm going to make you host so you can share your screen. I look forward to you sharing all that y'all are doing. Okay. Let me see. Yep, we can see that. Great. Yep. Uh, I'm going on okay. mute. Thanks for being here. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, let me first introduce myself in uh, 30 seconds. My name is Huub van der Pol. 
I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I'm the founder and director of Eye Contact, a Dutch company. Um, we're well a little bit famous uh, of one of the tools uh, we've developed ten years ago, Bookstream, which is a watermarking uh, solution for eBooks. Um, I'm here to tell you something about our newest development audience. Um, and um, I'd like to explain something about how to monetize your audio content and how you might be able to increase your revenue from audiobooks and podcasts. Um, first, uh, a little background. Uh, it's, it's 2022 and we're in the middle of a worldwide audio boom. It's clear for everyone. Um, in several countries, um, at least in, in Europe, but it's it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Uh, audio is the best performing segment in publishing. In some European countries, um, online audiobook revenue even outperforms sales by physical bookstores. So if you're a publisher with audio content, you likely uh, are having contracts with all the big international audio platforms like Audible, BookBeat, Kobo, Nextery, Podimo, Storytel, and soon Spotify can be added to the list as well. But are these sales and subscription platforms the best choice for your content? That depends. Let me explain. The advantages of the international platforms, which is basically uh, their large number of customers and their easy to use apps, don't always outweigh the disadvantages. Their profit margins are high. I mean, very high sometimes if you look at Audible. Your audio is much less visible due to the huge catalogs with competing titles. Detailed usage and consumer data is not shared with you. It's, it's from the platform, it's not for you. It might cost extra to promote your own titles in their apps. And curation of the apps, the content creation in the apps is usually based on what's best for the platform, not for you. So there we go. Uh, is there an alternative? Um, yes, there is an alternative. You can go direct to consumer with your audio. If you want a direct relationship with your customers, if you want to have more insights in their content usage, and if you want to curate your own content, there's an alternative. You can offer your audiobooks and podcasts using your own mobile app platform. Let me introduce audience, a white label, direct to consumer audio platform for publishers and web shops. Audience offers our customers a new way to monetize their audio content. It offers a direct relationship with their consumers. It offers detailed insights in the content usage, and it allows them to curate their own audio content and manage their own apps. The business model for audience is simple. There's a one-time configuration fee and an all-inclusive monthly service fee. And the net revenue, created by the audience platform is for our customer. We don't take anything from the net revenue. So what does it offer? Well, audience consists of a white labeled audiobook and podcast app combined with a powerful cloud-based CMS to ingest and manage audiobooks, podcasts, to maintain categories, to have all the statistics and to manage the app layout for your own apps. Every customer gets a fully branded app with their own name, logo, design specifics in the Apple and Google app stores. The idea behind it is that our customers do their own marketing and create and maintain their own customer base. So the result is you can have a powerful app platform, but you don't have to have an expensive development budget. Developing mobile apps is far too expensive for most companies. And that's exactly where audience comes in. Let me explain. One of our customers, the small publisher with only 300 audiobooks, um, they are not able to invest the, let's say, $100,000 dollars to have their own bespoke mobile apps and CMS. But while using when using audience, their own platform is already profitable with 200 monthly subscribers. 
And that's, that's, that's our bottom line. Using audience enables every publisher and web shop, no matter how small or niche, to monetize their own audio platform, which was impossible before. Let me focus on some key components. First, the CMS, this content management system. It uh, allows you to maintain the content in your own apps. Um, it has a smart metadata category manager, um, which means that uh, you can create rules um, based on the Onyx metadata, rules um, for combinations of BISEC, schema, keywords, and a lot of other uh, variables uh, in the metadata, um, which will um, uh, lead to automated uh, categories in the app. But you can also manually cur curate uh, the content. So you can push titles to the front page. You can uh, enter best-selling titles. Um, so it's a matter of uh, your own choice if you do manual curation or use the automatic rule-based curation. Then there's the app configuration. Um, there's a point and click system in the content management system where you can build the homepage of your app using uh, drag and drop content blocks um, with categories and other uh, types of data. Uh, so you maintain uh, all, the, um, all the content of your app using the content management system. It supports not only audiobooks, but you also can create uh, banners, uh, art, simple text articles. Um, so it's 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 uh, an app where you can show every every day you can show new content or information about uh, relevant uh, audio uh, books. Um, the content management system uh, has a dashboard um, and statistic functions. It, it shows uh, a daily and a weekly top five or 10 or top 100 uh, usage and consumption of the audio. Um, it can even show uh, real-time app usage, um, a list of activity in the apps. Um, the ISBN details can be exported. Uh, for instance, the listening time in seconds per month which is uh, used in subscription systems uh, to, to, uh, for the payout for the different uh, content owners. And every um, uh, usage, uh, all usage data can be exported um, using spreadsheet files. The apps themselves are best of breed. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to summarize uh, every uh, block here, but um, all app features you know from popular uh, international audiobook platforms like uh, Audible or Storytel is also incorporated in the white label apps from uh, audience. And then one uh, important feature, you can configure your own audio platform uh, using two different business models. You can choose between a la carte sales uh, or, uh, or a all-you-can-eat subscription model like Netflix. Uh, and both models even can be combined if uh, your own operation supports that. A further um, innovative feature is that uh, you don't, you, you, um, audience does not only support audiobooks, it also supports podcasts. Um, and they did, uh, it is supported in the single app. Um, all audio content is searchable in a combined catalog, um, which means that if you are looking for a specific content based on uh, metadata or uh, title words or words at, uh, from the description, the hit list contains um, audiobooks and podcasts. And with podcasts, it uh, shows um, podcast shows and podcast episodes as well. Um, the app supports the specifics of each uh, format. So an audiobook can have chapters and uh, chapter names, and the podcast can have shows and a growing number, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, a podcast show can have a growing number of episodes uh, which can be updated uh, every uh, 24 hours. 
Um, the audio audience platform itself um, offers um, a, a set of powerful uh, APIs, and these APIs can be used to drive uh, a website or uh, can connect to a web shop, depending on your own use case. Um, to start with, audience can be hooked up to uh, a web shop or user management system, uh, which means that if you already uh, are selling uh, audiobooks, the integration with audience um, is quite simple. Um, another example, if you have a website with user registration functions, but you don't want to sell audiobooks, uh, but you want to offer a subscription system, uh, the user registration from your own website um, can be used to uh, onboard the subscribers in the audio app. And APIs uh, are available for all um, important uh, features like user registration, uh, exposing the audio catalog so you can fill your website with it. Uh, all metadata is available. Um, all categories which you maintain in the content management system is, are available through the API. And the search engine itself is also um, available through the API. To load audience with the audio content, um, you can uh, use the standard industry standard FTP uh, connection uh, to ingest audiobooks um, like uh, audios, audiobooks from distributors like Ingram or Bookwire. Podcasts will be ingested using uh, the, the standard RSS feeds. Um, and of course, audience uses uh, every book industry standard. Um, I've mentioned Onyx, uh, but also Bizec, Thema Subject Codes, MP3 audio files, and web service APIs. Um, one of the um, uh, of um, a revenue shared subscription um, app is, is used by our launching customer, it's the Dutch publisher Home. They are using the audience platform to offer their audio lectures in a uh, all you can eat subscription model with their own branded apps based on audience. It's a revenue shared model, uh, which means that the uh, subscribers pay a fixed amount uh, per month, uh, 10 euros. And uh, the payout to the authors and, and the content owners is based on the seconds, uh, the, the amount of seconds listened to their titles per month. Um, and uh, based on the, the total amount of income paid by the subscribers. So let's say that um, all subscribers uh, pay um, 10,000 euros a month. 80% um, of this amount is shared among the different authors based on the, the number of time uh, the subscribers list to their content. The fact that, that uh, our launching customer um, uh, uses audience means that they're able to promote their brand and, and know their customers. And they get a higher profit per consumer compared to having their content uh, at BookBeat, Nextree, or Storytel, for example. Another example, another customer uh, is a traditional web shop, an audio book web shop. Uh, that uh, sells audiobooks a la carte. Um, and they were in need for audiobook apps, but also in for a new website. Um, and again, audience for them an affordable solution. Um, the new web shop is fully powered by the uh, audience uh, content management system uh, and the APIs. And there's a perfect integration uh, between the apps and the web shop. Um, and, and looking at the figures, uh, you can say that even a modest web shop selling 10 audiobooks per day can be profitable uh, using audience because of the low service fee. 
Well, just uh, to to describe where we are uh, currently, <clears throat> uh, we've announced audience last year during the Frankfurt Book Fair. We've shown uh, we've showed uh, beta versions at the book fairs this year. Uh, we're going to show uh, live versions of uh, of our customers' uh, apps uh, during Digital Book World in January, um, and we're very uh, sure that that our formula uh, with audience um, could be a success uh, because uh, it it is either an alternative uh, to the international audiobook platforms or a risk-free addition for our customers. They don't have to choose. They can easily create their own uh, apps while also offering their titles at, at, the, uh, at the other platforms. Um, and um, we're very happy to say that we've been nominated for a Future Book Award. Uh, and that's why I'm in London. Uh, next Friday uh, is Future Book and Perhaps uh, we win a prize, but not sure yet. Summing up, uh, audience offers publishers and web shops that were previously excluded from the audio market the opportunity to have their own affordable and powerful audio platform. And the bottom line is that audience will make the audio market more inclusive and diverse. That concludes my, uh, my presentation. Ooh, they, yeah, that was great. Um, so yeah, you're you're doing you're doing something interesting. I'm gonna leave this up for another couple of seconds. So, we, but uh, we'll also, like I said, be sending people's contact information out. Um, I'm gonna hit reclaim host. Um, congratulations on uh, what you built, and you know we always like to pay attention to companies that kind of. <clears throat> bring together audiobooks and podcasts. Uh, we've always viewed those as uh, obviously cut from the same cloth, and there's a lot of opportunities with one that ought to be extended to the other. So uh, good luck. I uh, hope you win the award and looking forward to seeing you in January. Yes, likewise. Thanks. Appreciate. Yeah, you got it. Appreciate you giving us some time. And so I'm going to put you back as attendee. And um, we have got Leslie with eBooks to go. And let me promote the panelist here. We'll see if this works. It should. <laughs> uh, it might take, there we go. So Leslie, if you can hear me, I can see you. We're going. Hi. Hello, Leslie. How are you? Good. Good. Nice to see you. I hope you're well. Yeah. Good to see you. So I just renamed your account uh, to your actual name. Thank you. Uh, happy to do that. So thank you for being part of Digital Book World Global with us. Uh, we're excited to have you be part of January as well. Uh, I'm going to make you host and let you get rocking and rolling. Okay. Thank you for having us. We're happy to be back at Digital Book World. It's always been one of our favorite conferences of the year. Um, okay. What y'all are doing is interesting. It's a little bit, it's a little bit different and uh, excited to hear you. And so um, you should be able to share your screen. I can see it, and it's it's in um, kind of thumbnail view. I don't know if that's intentional or if you want to make it full screen. If you leave it as is, it's 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 fine. Oh, there you go. That's perfect. All right, Leslie, thank you for being part of DVW Global. I'm going on mute. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so our company is a pretty much a one stop shop in publishing for um, publishers. Um, we also help authors um, from start to finish get published. Um, we have two different companies. Um, one is Gantic Publishing Solutions and the other is eBooks to Go. Um, Gantic Publishing was established in 2008 as an in independent company, but actually started in 2003. Um, we, that part of our company 
concentrates more on the academic um, publishing sector. Um, where eBooks to go um, is a leading solutions provider worldwide. We deliver a ho holistic system complete with editorial services, book production, content conversion, title management, global distribution, um, custom application development, marketing, and sales. Um, whether you're looking for a reliable vendor to make a tight deadline or a long-term partner to revamp or repurpose your catalog, eBooks to Go is a perfect choice to complement your vision and supplement your content. Um, all in all, both companies do the same work. Um, our production teams um, were located in Schaumburg, Illinois. And then our production teams um, are in Chennai, Hyderabad, and Singapore. And um, they've been around for a very long time. We provide pretty much worry-free publishing. Um, Gantic Publishing offers expert content services and customized end-to-end -end solutions for an array of publishing companies using highly skilled professionals located here in the U.S. and through offshore delivery centers in India. Gantic delivers measurable results to clients using innovative and cost-effective publishing methods to drive profitability. We serve trade, academic, and non-academic pu book publishers, magazine, and journal publishers by managing all phases of pre-press production process for books and journals, from raw manuscripts to delivering a final finished product in both print and digital formats. We also receive a flawless book with Gantic's reliable editing service. Our editors possess more than 15 years of experience cleaning up author manuscripts and are proficient in each of the world's most popular style guides. They also never miss a deadline. Our service options include copy editing, proofreading, and developmental editing. Our distribution. Simplify your ebook distribution with ebooks to go. We relieve you of all the tedious tasks involved in the distribution process, including accounting, metadata management, ebook version management, DRM encryption, file uploads, and pricing and discounts. As you know, time is money. And we want to make sure nothing distracts you from growing your business. The way that distribution works with us is you upload your manuscript um, to our portal, or um, we give you an FTP account um, after we have come up with um, the royalty agreements. Um, we don't take any um, cut up front, um, but after your book sells, we get 10% of the royalty. Now, the nice thing for publishers is we handle all the management of the books. Um, you get a sales reporting tool where you can log into your account and be able to see your sales by month, by day, by retailer. And then our favorite um, for publishers is being able to see what country the book is sold in. So that metadata that you get is um, amazing um, to at least know that your books are popular in France or you know Germany. <laughs> um, here's our distribution partners. We partner with 16 different major chains. Um, Google, Barnes & Noble, Follett, Overdrive, Biblioteca, Scribd, Ingram Spark, EBSCO, Kobo, Baker, Taylor, Odillo, Hoopla, Amazon, Mac and um, Apple. We have our own bookstore, ebooks2go.com. Um, digital transformation. Gantic Publishing specializes in transforming books, academic content, journals, documents, and manuscripts into easy to access e-publishing formats such as EPUB, EPUB3, fixed layout ebooks with audio syncing, um, web ready ebooks, as well as XML formats such as PubMed, including XML tagging and metadata attributes. Um, one of the great things about our company is we can pretty much fix anything and we kind of work as a ebook doctor. So if you've gone to someone else and you have found that your files are messy, we can fix them. Um, our team is very skilled. Um, marketing services. We offer several marketing services for authors and publishers based on your individual needs. You can purchase our services a la carte or through sp specially designed packages. Whether you need to grow your fan base or increase your book sales, we have the knowledge and strategy to accompany your main objectives. 
Um, our marketing services options, um, social media marketing, SEO, email marketing, and the PPC. Um, the great thing about um, our marketing team is they really um, know the market. They've been in um, the book business um, over 10 years and really know um, how the searchability works and how readers are trying to um, find the books. So if you need um, to have your catalog re-looked at, your metadata, um, we can help vamp that up. Um, recently, um, this is something that we developed during COVID. And what this is, is a white label app development. Um, eBooks to Go white label app is a user-friendly direct to reader solution that securely sells your eBooks and audiobooks to the end customer. This custom reader app follows all of EDR Labs open standards, creating an accessible catalog and an enjoyable reading experience across all Android and iOS devices. Add in real-time push notifications, glamorous book displays, and outstanding technical support, and you have tools that you need to increase your ebook sales and build customer loyalty. Our white label app features push notifications about sales and new releases, intuitive sales reports, seamless e-commerce integration, DRM protection, single sign-on, stunning catalog displays, and smart audio player. We have also developed our own Easy Reads app, and this app is to help discover new cat catalogs that maybe you wouldn't have seen before. We have designed this app that has given each publisher its own card. So maybe you're not an eBooks to go reader, but you're a Boys Town Press reader and you come onto this app and you discover our catalog or vice versa. We want to be able to expand readers variety of reading. Um, and then eBooks to go services, um, book production, distribution, eBook conversions, marketing, and white label app development. And our proud clients um, that we have worked with. Um, and that's what we have today. Um, one, we have a lot going on at all times. <laughs> um, we really <laughs> try to make sure that we cover all aspects. Um, our company is also launching audio um, distribution this year. So that will be our next thing. Um, at Digital Book World, we are going to be demoing our new app developments that we have made and created. Very nice. I'm going to hit reclaim host. Yeah, Leslie, y'all, um, I was surprised. I didn't, I didn't know half of that that was in there, but that's why I listened to these presentations. Uh, y'all uh, are doing a bunch of stuff and, um, you know, kudos to to you. I, I, just, I like the, another thing I always like about digital book world and just this, this uh, industry and the ecosystem is um, companies that have a mind toward making it easier for individual authors, you know, yeah, we cover a lot of the big industry stuff and digital book world 2023 will probably end up being the largest, um, probably easily being the largest publishing industry event uh, in the United States, um, you know, over a 12 month period, but uh, alongside all the big industry stuff, you know, the Simon and Schuster and Penguin Random House and Spotify and Audible and everybody else. I love groups like y'all that, that democratize, you know, continue to find ways to democratize uh, publishing. So hats off to you. Yeah. Thank you for being part of uh, DBW Global, Leslie, and I'm going to put you back as attendee. Uh, so look, appreciate uh, all six companies that made the time uh, today to be part of DBW Global. So in summary, everybody who's registered will get access to the audio and video of the proceedings. Um, as soon as we get them, it might be today, it might be tomorrow. Usually it'll it'll be one of the two. Uh, Digital Book World 2023, uh, we've got the program in place. Uh, that's on Eventbrite, or you can go to digitalbookworld.com to view that. Really exciting. Um, and uh, we'll be a packed house. So we're excited for that, uh, just the gathering community. I'm Bradley Metrock, CEO of Project Voice, executive producer of Digital Book World. Thank you for taking the time, and we hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye.